Um, I was on a fire on the Feather River and I can't remember if I was doing GIS on it or why exactly I was there. Um, all I remember is the pager going off and I was uh, assigned to uh, California Incident Management Team 3. And um, before the morning briefing, we had already heard about the attacks on the Twin Towers. And at first it was like, oh, an airplane hit the tower and it sounded like an accident. And then when the second one hit, everybody started putting the pieces together. And then uh, there was the attack on the Pentagon. So our pagers went off and all they said was report to McClellan. And that was weird. Um, there was a certain amount of nervousness when your country's been attacked. And now all of a sudden they're going, we're going to send you at least to the area that has been attacked. So that in itself was a little disconcerting. Uh, it was a hurry up and wait, wait, wait. So we got to McClellan, and the one thing to keep in mind is all the aircraft in the entire nation were grounded. So there was kind of a, why are we going to an airport if you can't fly? So we did a lot of waiting around, and finally all the phone calls had made sense, and they said, your plane's 30 minutes out. Well, it was the normal uh, evergreen 737s that they have on contract year round, and it landed and of course there was nobody there you know normally when plane lands you have baggage handlers and a guy moving a step and everything else no there was nothing the plane the, everything was shut down at every airport at this point and i remember going this is really weird you know we're up in the hole of the airplane loading all the bags and everything else and when airborne uh, we stopped i think in albuquerque to pick up another fed team and they were going to the Twin Towers and we were going to the Pentagon. And nobody could sleep. And finally we started seeing the sun start to rise from the airplane windows. And we looked out and saw actual jet fighters on each side of the 737. And we're like, that's pretty awesome. And we thought we are getting an escort. We felt pretty important until we realized they were there to shoot down the airplane had it veered off course. And we no longer felt cool anymore. And I remember landing at the airport in DC and again, it was a ghost town. It was the middle of the day, one of the busier airports in the nation and not a single person, not a single vehicle, nothing. And the same thing, we had to find a truck that was unlocked with the in order to unload the airplane. Um, we had to make phone calls and wait for somebody just to show up there to unlock gates. I mean, it was completely shut down. We first got there, they had no idea what to do with a four service type one team. You're kind of in the uh, center of municipal firefighting. You're in Washington, D.C., and you have all these big city f fire departments. You have Fairfax County Fire, you have D.C. Fire, and now all of a sudden you have all these guys in green jeans showing up from the forest saying, hey, we're here to help. And they're like, mm, yeah, okay, why don't you guys, why don't you guys go clean the barracks? You know, we have all these USAR teams showing up here, and we're going to need lot logistics, so you guys just do the, the general cleanup. Whatever you guys need, we're, we want to do anything we can to help out. And it was pretty neat because the pecking order on, on teams is, you know, your ops guys are always the cool kids and then maybe the planning guys come next and then, you know, logistics falls a little lower on the, on the totem pole. Well, now everybody was in logistics and it was kind of fun to see everybody equalized amongst the entire team. You know, the guys are driving the little uh, little carts to empty trash. And, you know, here are these really cool ops guys now being the trash collectors of base camp. But it was really neat. It did a lot to bring the team very close together. Everybody had a dose of, oh, this is what it's like to do somebody else's job. We did that for a couple days. We were mopping floors, setting up cots, anything we could do to support the USAR team. 
and we wanted to do more. We knew if we could get into the main area of the disaster that there's other skill sets that we bring just because the teams are used so much that they become very rehearsed at it. And so the USAR teams have very small planning sections assigned to them, like three or four guys, whereas a type one team has about 12 people to run multiple shifts. Probably the biggest turning point was when it came down to the IEP. On the, the national USAR teams don't come with the planning support that they really need. And they started falling behind just due to the sheer numbers. I mean, you had a crime scene, you had a terrorist scene, you had a hazardous material scene, you had a firefighting operation, you had a, um, you know, you had the Department of corner affairs. I mean, it was just bizarre, all the different agencies and acronyms and everything else that were involved there and how out of place the Forest Service really seemed. I mean, the Pentagon is a limestone building. It's made of major blocks. They even have draped Kevlar into the walls as it was built to withstand a blast. Um, now it had a gaping hole in it and you had all these responders that were trying to do anything they could to help out. Uh, once the fire was out, um, at this point, it was just trying to make sure there was nobody else most likely found dead in the building, and so they had to search every square inch. Well, being that they couldn't keep up with the IAPs, they finally came and asked our, uh, someone on our plan and said, hey, you guys write IAPs, is there a way that you guys could help us? And we're like, that's what we're here to do. We'd be more than happy to. And they said, what's the problem? And they said, well, can you run down to Kinko's and make copies? And they're like, why would we want to do that? Why don't we just get a couple commercial copiers and bring them in to the base camp and then you don't have to make any more runs? They're like, how would we do that? And we go, well, we go see Ruby and finance and she will make phone calls and give them her million dollar credit card and you'll have two rental commercial Xerox machines here to take care of making all your plans. And that was kind of the, the gateway. Once that happened, then they're like, well, what else can you guys do? And at that point, even though I was assigned to fire behavior on the team, there's literally one tree in the center of the five acres within the Pentagon. Um, that was the only wildland in the entire place, so there wasn't a whole lot of fire behavior to do. But we uh, had a young lady by the name of Heather who was assigned to do our, our GIS technical specialist job. And we did a lot of, of work together. Um, and so I said, hey, I'll basically help you and we'll work together on all the GIS requests if there are any. Well, at that point, um, we started producing a couple things. I called ESRI and they put me in touch with their folks in DC. I just said, hey, can I get an aerial photo of the Pentagon? And they said, sure. When do you need it? And I said, well, yesterday would be nice, but as soon as possible. And they said, okay. I said, hey, I need a large format plotter. They said, okay. So within a few hours, a delivery van, they call me from the lobby of the hotel and they said, hey, uh, you got trucks pulling up and you have deliveries. And I said, yeah, I need a, I need a conference room. And they said, okay. Everybody was very cooperative at this point. You could have gotten anything for nothing at this point if you wore a uniform. So we got a conference room, we moved a large format plotter in there, which ESRI was nice enough to make phone calls and make all this equipment and software just show up out of nowhere. The most bizarre thing is I walked back to my hotel room to grab something and I opened the door and someone had slide, slid a CD with aerial photos of the Pentagon under my door. No notes, no nothing. I didn't ask any questions, but it was to this day one of the more bizarre things that I remember. It took us a couple days before they would let us into the inner circle of where the, the damage occurred. Uh, everybody had to go through a pretty extensive background check and you had to get your laminate background card. And so, um, I remember right when I got into the fenced off area that I was like, okay, I gotta try to find some data, produce something so these people know that we have value to add to what they're doing. 
and I'm walking around the compound and there's a couple construction trailers. And I walk into the construction trailer and I just said, are you guys doing the remodel? And the guy goes, yeah. And I said, do you have blueprints? And he said, yes, we do. And I said, are they in CAD format? And he goes, yes, they are. And I said, can I get a copy of the DVDs? Back then, I guess it would be a CD. And he said, sure, but it's going to take a while. And I said, when do you want me to come back? He goes, give us 30 minutes. And it's pretty scary to think about, but within 30 minutes, I had blueprints to the Pentagon. And uh, like I said, they, anybody would give you anything because they thought they were helping. And they were, because it was really probably the most important data. It literally had every structural member and then we could go in there and look at the damage and say, okay, this structural member's missing, this one's half missing, this one's got no damage. Um, this sector has been searched, this sector has not been searched, and so it became really important data to start capturing where people were found, the amount of data or the amount of damage that has occurred in the building, how possibly the, train, the plane traveled through the building based on the damage. I did some 3D modeling of the structural members based on the weights of damage we assigned to each column. So it became a really important data to have. And uh, the more we did, the more requests started coming left and right. It was pretty, pretty phenomenal that at one minute we're the dirt diggers from the Forest Service and the next minute uh, we got the FBI coming to us going, hey, can you produce this? Can you do this? Or the De Department of Coroner Affairs. It, it was some bizarre title like that. I think the one memory that I'll remember most is people often want you to do maps right away and I'll always say, no, we, we need to hold off. I need to see the whole picture. Um, I, I've made some bad maps in the past by being in a rush and not taking a big circle around something and then starting to focus on it. And I see, I, I need to go in there and walk around and see what's going on. So when I look at this data, I can actually know what I'm looking at. And they said, okay. So they gave me a respirator and gave me a, a USAR helmet and gave me a, a guide because it's very easy to get lost in a building of that size. And you would walk into an area with almost no damage. And then you go down a floor or up a floor and it starts painting a picture of how the heat traveled when the aviation fuel went off. We're talking tremendous amounts of heat. Then you have a limestone building. So what they've built is probably the best oven known to mankind to hold all that heat within it. And you'd walk into this office and at first glance it would look like there was no damage at all. And then you'd walk up to the telephone and it was, you know, half its normal size. It shrank due to the heat. Or they'd have these carpet tiles, the old peeled back carpets that you lay down quickly and cheaply. And the same thing is they had shrunk down to one quarter of their normal size. And it showed you no fire damage, just pure heat that traveled through this building and I'm sure caused a lot of the fatalities. So that, that, that's something that will always stick in my mind.